Today on Brain Ponderings, it's my pleasure to welcome Professor Thomas Sudoff. He's a professor in the Department of Molecular and Cellular Physiology and also neurosurgery at Stanford University School of Medicine. He's the Abram Goldstein Professor and Investigator at Howard Hughes Medical Institute. So he's had, they've supported his work for a long time now. And um, yeah, my colleague here at Hopkins, Rick Hugener, has also been a Howard Hughes investigator for a long time, and that was a nice mechanism for really uh, enabling and advancing work of prominent scientists like yourself. Okay, so the the topic of, of today's uh, conversation is going to be molecular codes for synapse formation and specificity. Before we get into the science, uh, Tom, can you talk about your background? You you grew up in Germany, uh, in Gottingen, is that right? Yes, so I am German. I came to the United States after finishing my medical studies. I was trained as a doctor originally to be a postdoc with Joe Goldstein and Mike Brown at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center, where I worked on cholesterol metabolism. I cloned the LDL receptor gene and elucidated its mechanism of cholesterol-dependent regulation. So I used to... That was, that was a contribution to their Nobel Prize then, I guess. I hope so, yes. Yeah. And, but even before that in Gottingen, so I understand, did you have parents that were in the sciences or <laughs> at the university or... My father was at the university at some point, but he died very early. So um, mm. those are the things that happened. <laughs> that was before the advent of uh, effective treatments for um, uh, heart disease, atherosclerosis, these kinds of disorders, which are still the major killer of people up to these days. Yeah. So did, you know, so Brown and Goldstein and, and your contribution, you know, they showed the importance of the LDL receptor and getting cholesterol out of the blood. And also there's genetic mutations or variants of that receptor that predispose people to early atherosclero to atherosclerosis and maybe early heart attacks. Is do you know if your father, I mean, that's kind of a personal thing, but do you know if you're, you, you said he died young. Do you think he had some genetic factor? I'd have. Okay. Embarrassingly, I don't know what my Apple E status is. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> and that, that's important for both the heart and, and the brain. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I um, think cholesterol story, uh, the whole issue of atherosclerosis is a paradigm, maybe not sufficiently realized paradigm for many other common disorders. Certainly a paradigm that hasn't been completed yet because the initial studies now going back 50 years, identifying cholesterol as a key risk factor for atherosclerosis was certainly groundbreaking and led to the development of statins, which in turn has clearly saved millions of lives, I yeah. think. Yeah. However, atherosclerosis continues to be the major killer of people yeah. in our lives and the continuation of that uh, line of thought, of that investigation is happening as we speak and extends to the realm of inflammation, mm -hmm. which again, in some ways mirrors neurodegenerative diseases where you both have a clear-cut familial genetic component, but also an inflammatory component that contributes significantly to the disease. Neither in atherosclerosis, I think, nor 
in your degenerative disease, do we really understand the inflammatory component of the disease? And that, you know, that that's, that can be counteracted somewhat with regular exercise. And then something we've worked on a lot over the years on effects of caloric restriction and intermittent fasting on the brain. We focus on the brain, but those two things have anti-inflammatory effects and they seem to be generally good for everything. Um, so you, you got your PhD work at, at Gottingen, you, you were working on these, these cells in the middle of the adrenal gland that secrete epinephrine, the chromaffin cells, is that right? When I was a graduate student, um, I, my thesis work was actually in biophysics. Oh, okay. And, um, we worked on the structure, on the biophysical structure of secretory vesicles in the adrenal gland, yeah. which was the model system then that was quite popular. Um, I have actually never really worked on any preparation that the biological preparation as a graduate student but worked entirely on uh, biophysical characterizations of uh, organelles and proteins. Um, I see. Okay, but that that was where you got your interest in secretion. And then, then over mm -hmm. the subsequent years, uh, you know, uh, after your work on the LDL receptor and so on, you shifted to to neuro, neuroscience and presynaptic terminals and you and your, your lab members over the years worked out the molecular control of the vesicles that hold the neurotransmitter, their movement to the mem presynaptic membrane and fusion. Can, and that's what you were, shared the Nobel Prize for your work on those secretory vesicle systems. You shared it with Randy Sheckman and Jim Rothman. Can you, I know this is hard because it's a, a huge amount of information, but try to kind of summarize kind of chronologically how you went about working on the control. And I guess we can start with calcium. I think most people know who are listening to this that when a neur neuron fires, calcium goes in and that happens in the presynaptic terminal. So what, what happens after calcium comes in? When I started my independent career, I decided to work on neurotransmitter release yeah. because at that point, um, which is almost 40 years ago, unfortunately, um, it was well known from electrophysiological studies, in particular pioneering studies of two giants in the field, you know, like Bernard Katz and uh, Chuck Stevens, that neurotransmitter release was a incredibly well controlled, highly regulated process that was very, very fast. And it was inconceivable how it might be possible for neurotransmitters to be released in that time frame with that precision by synaptic vesicle excitosis. It had been established, especially by Bernard Katz, that that was the mechanism. And although it was still controversial to some extent, the controversy was really rather artificial in the sense that the people who doubted that mechanism were um, not very convincing in their arguments. So I decided to study neurotransmitter release because it was an electrophysiological phenomenon without a molecular or physiological or cellular or mechanistic explanation. Um, and I thought it would be amenable, amenable to that. And over the following 20 years or so, actually probably more closely 25 years because uh, key data were obtained really when I, after I'd moved to Stanford in 2011. Um, basically, I think provided a framework for explaining how it works that has, I believe, been 
uh, in operation ever since. And that framework um, consists of three components, really. Um, first, a fusion machinery that was also um, identified by um, Randy Shackman and uh, Jim Rothman in their studies and that membrane fusion machinery is one component of the three components that we identified, consists of snares and SM proteins like monkey teen. And those form complexes that then force the membranes together and make them fuse. The second component is the regulation of that fusion machinery by calcium, which acts by binding to a set of proteins called synaptotagmins that are calcium sensors and basically transduce the calcium signal into a fusion event. That's the second component that we identified. And that is not only operating at the synapse, but generally applies to all calcium dependent fusion processes leading to secretion and endocrine others, even mast cells. And the third component is specific to synapses. It's the only component that's specific to synapses. Um, and that component is the scaffolding machinery of the active zone at the synapse that links calcium channels, which mediate the calcium influx, to a matrix, a scaffold, that also recruits the vesicles and tethers them and docks them at the release sites. So it pulls together all these uh, elements and that scaffold that uh, we identified consists of a complex of proteins that are uh, multi-domain proteins such as RIM, which is the most central component that we identified in 2001, I believe, um, together with uh, proteins like RIM binding protein among 13 that we actually identified first, um, <clears throat> Liprens and others. And they basically bring this whole thing together in a manner that can be varied by alternative splicing, which then causes different shapes and distances and dynamics and short-term plasticity, but the overall principle is always the same for all synapses, wherever they are. So these three facets, as far as I know, apply to any synapse, any chemical synapse in a mammalian body and probably also in an invertebrate, um, to explain how an action potential can trigger the calcium dependent fusion of a synaptic vesicle that then leads, leads to incredibly rapid but very brief bursts of neurotransmitter release. And so these are on a millisecond time scale. And yeah, so this is <laughs> very critical for like, like if you go to textbook, I don't know what Tandell and Schwartz says actually now, but. A lot of previous, you know, diagrams of a presynaptic terminal will show calcium coming in kind of all over the place. And and so I guess people were thinking early on, you just get the calcium's coming in throughout the presynaptic terminal. But your findings show how the scaffold keeps the calcium channels localized right where the vesicles are fusing. So that calcium, it, right, it comes in right there and has its effect? Yes, absolutely. But we didn't show that the calcium oh. is localized. That was done earlier by people like Rodolfo Linas, who oh. did some pioneering work, George Augustine, uh, actually Roger Eckert, even earlier than that, who mm -hmm. demonstrated very beautifully classical physiology 50 years ago that calcium influx is localized. Our work explains how it is localized. The okay. fact that it is localized was known. And okay. there is really, you know, gorgeous physiology that was done classically that um, established the physiology, you know, the phenomena 
It didn't explain them. Our work is a mechanistic explanation of something that other people had discovered, okay? Yeah. We didn't discover this. Okay. Um, right, and there's no role for the actin cytoskeleton or any... There always is a role for the actin cytoskeleton. Oh, okay. There's nothing in biology where the actin cytoskeleton doesn't okay. have a role. In the case of the synapse, Presynaptically, the actor synaptic skeleton clearly has a role for the perisynaptic area where it basically serves to um, form a kind of a, you know, like a house where you have a framework that keeps everything in place. Yeah. Yes. So, um, and actin cytoskeletons is very important, again, as classical work has shown dating back actually to John Heuser's beautiful, Tom Reese's beautiful EM work, uh, has a clear role in endocytosis, but um, it is not actually in the vesicle cluster. There's no actin. And okay. yeah, so there was some ideas initially that maybe the vesicles are uh, moved on actin when they're in the cluster and that, that actin is an organizing principle within the vesicle cluster and release machinery that hasn't turned out to be the case. Nevertheless, actin obviously is important. I don't know anything in biology where actin isn't important. You know, it's one of those things. Yeah. Where it's everywhere. Yeah. <clears throat> and Okay, so now you've been working, I guess, in the last... 15, maybe 20 years on an even more complicated problem and basic issue <laughs> in neuroscience is that what determines the specificity of, of synapses and their formation? Um, and, you know, early on, we learned that connections are made in an activity dependent manner, neurons that fire together, wire together, and that kind of a thing, and we learned about uh, neurotrophic factors uh, playing some role in that. But to get to the actual specificity of individual synapses, that, that information doesn't go too far. So you've been trying to identify what you call molecular codes for synapse formation and specificity, you know, proteins, in the presynaptic terminal, which I, when I was a postdoc, my mentor, Stan Cater, he would say uh, a, a, uh, a synapse is a stable growth cone or, you know, so because they're very similar, like the axonal, we found the axonal growth cones when they're growing towards the dendrite, at least glutamatergic neurons, they release glutamate, that glutamate causes philopodia to extend to the, the axonal growth cone from the dendrite. And then further interactions lead to kind of the consolidation of the synapse. So if we block glutamate receptors, then we impair the synapse formation. But that, that doesn't really get it. You've got there are what hundred trillion glutamatergic synapses in the brain, and they're not all the same, right? In their molecular composition. Can you talk about how you're trying to get at this very difficult problem? I can try. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you know, for me, it is always fascinating to try to probe and explore questions that seem to be uh, impenetrable because they seem to be insanely complex and mm -hmm. um, uh, just very opaque. Um, and I believe that in biology, like in all sciences, in the end, one can reduce questions to simpler solutions once one has a better understanding. And the same thing applies to the question of synaptic connectivity. So um, it is true that an em enormous amount of beautiful work, again, some of it dating back 50, 100 years, but much of it 
more recent, revealed that the connections in brain exhibit a enormous complexity in the sense that neurons are linked to each other by synapses that can be reproducibly or um, uh, consistently observed in the same place formed by the same classes of neurons. And these networks, these circuits, are often activity independent. Work that we originally did more than 20 years ago showed that you can actually get a basic wiring diagram of the brain established initially during development without any neurotransmitter release. And more recently, uh, really very nice studies, for example, from Niels Brozes and Anton Maximov's labs has shown that um, using less drastic procedures than we did initially, that um, the basic wiring diagram, for example, of the cortex is completely activity independent. Hmm. And in fact, um, this is not totally new because even Larry Katz, who tragically died some 20 years ago, had already shown this for the visual cortex. Um, so um, on the other hand, activity plays an enormous role in uh, refining and remodeling yeah. circuits. There's no question about that. So in many ways, what we know now is that the specificity of synapses is astonishingly reproducible. It is partly totally activity independent, but partly activity dependent. Moreover, we do know that the properties of synapses in many brain regions is highly activity dependent in the sense that there's short-term and long-term plasticity. And there's many different forms of plasticity. Where we stand in this field based on the physiology, on the uh, description of synapses is that there probably are thousands of different types of synapses that are continuously being remodeled in an activity dependent manner, but often are initially established in an activity independent manner. Yes. So it's neither nor, it's neither fish nor flesh. It's basically um, something where you have both activity dependent and independent mechanisms, which is really in itself quite remarkable. Um, <clears throat> What we have done is taken a very um, simplistic reductionist brute force approach. We have basically gone into this with the proposition that a synapse is an intercellular junction where two cells, usually two neurons, but sometimes a presynaptic neuron with a postsynaptic cell, affect a cell, form a junction with each other that is specialized for information processing computational changes of information as it is being transferred from one cell to the next. And as an intercellular junction, all intercellular junctions in biology are governed by transcellular interactions via so-called adhesion molecules that serve to function as signaling devices. And so our reductionist proposition is that all synapses are ruled by intercellular signaling complexes mediated by adhesion molecules. Moreover, cell biologically, synapses are really interesting in the sense that presynaptically, as I tried to describe already for the release machinery, synapses are pretty much the same in design and architecture. There's differences, but the fundamental design presynaptic is always the same. Postsynaptically, they're totally different. There's no similarity between a glutamate receptor and a GABA receptor. They're just different. Right. And as a result, you have a presynaptic uniformity, relatively speaking. Of course, there are vast differences, but these are variations on a theme with a postsynaptic diversity. 
And um, <clears throat> we need to understand this design principle on the basis of transsynaptic adhesion and signaling complexes. And so our approach has been figure out what are the transsynaptic adhesion complexes? How do they work? What is their diversity? What are the common principles? And take it from there. And um, it's a reductionist approach. It is, the idea is <laughs> take it apart. You know, it's yeah. pretty much uh, a simplistic approach. Um, God knows whether it will actually ever uh, really explain a synapse. But I think it has promise in at least providing some rules and some ideas of how it might work and providing some um, points where others, not just us, can actually try to um, elaborate and expand towards a description of how a synapse is put together. And so this work has led to um, a description of, of uh, a number of key complexes. Uh, we have worked extensively on neurexins, which turn out to be probably the most important hub molecules on the presynaptic side that via interactions with more than 50 different postsynaptic ligands really instruct the synapse in terms of properties, to some extent at least. It doesn't explain everything, but it does. They, these complexes do explain a lot of their variation of the properties that synapses have in terms of, let's say, receptor composition, release probability, you know, these kinds of things, uh, plasticity. Um, and, and Tom, so the neurexins, they're integral membrane proteins in the presynaptic membrane and they extend out into the synaptic cleft, is that right? Correct, yeah. So the neurexins are a family of evolutionarily conserved proteins encoded by three genes that are um, all intrinsic type 1 membrane proteins. They have a single transmembrane region. They extend into the synaptic cleft. They're also extrasynaptic, like all synaptic proteins are to some extent. Mm -hmm. Within the synapse, they bind to postsynaptic adhesion molecules in the transsynaptic interactions that is mediated via a large number of splice variants. There's more than a thousand isoforms that have been demonstrated, not just by combinatorial uh, calculations, but actually by packed biosequencing, which is a way of how you can do this. And um, in addition, the axons interact in cis on the presynaptic side with other presynaptic proteins to form some kind of transsynaptic interaction network that coordinates pre- and post-synaptic signaling in a manner that the precise nature of any given set of interactions determines what the properties of a given synapse are. And so that is one key mechanism by which synapses Synapse properties are determined, okay? And there's others as well. This, But uh, it certainly is something that has emerged over the last decade as uh, one of the master regulation mechanisms for synapse properties. And one of the, one of the postsynaptic proteins that this norexin interacts with and, and apparently affects synaptic function, if I'm you know, read your work right, is um, it's a glutamate receptor-like protein. In other words, protein similar to a certain type of glutamate receptor called GLU-D1. Yeah, so there's a diversity of um, transsynaptic interactions that are dictated by affinities which in turn depend on the exact splice variants and isoforms that are expressed on each side. What you're referring to is a truly fascinating discovery that not we made, but others made, especially uh, Mishina and Yuzaki labs in Japan, who demonstrated beautifully 
that presynaptic neuroaxons bind to a family of postsynaptic molecule called GLUDI via an adapter intermediate that's called cerebellum, huh. which seems to indicate it's in the cerebellum, but it isn't. It's a sort of historical name because it's also in the cerebellum and it's a secreted adapter that's everywhere in brain, more or less. And that sort of links these two sites together. And blue Ds are fascinating in their own right. Uh, and really Machina in particular has done some fantastic work there in the past um, because they look like glutamate receptors. That's why they're called glue D, but they are not glutamate receptors. They are evolved from glutamate receptors. And as we have found uh, now via this binding with cell balance and neuroaxons, these glue Ds that look like glutamate receptors but aren't glutamate receptors actually regulate glutamate receptors. So it's in some <laughs> way um, an evolutionarily uh, a cogent, you know, it's quite an interesting evolutionary yeah. relationship where you evolve a derivative of a glutamate receptor to regulate glutamate receptors in turn, an evolutionary kind of history that is not uncommon where uh, the regulator of a response is actually derived from the original response evolutionarily. So that is one piece. Another postsynaptic recipient of neuroaxon signals and a postsynaptic sort of signal for presynaptic neuroaxons in turn, because it goes both ways, are so-called neuroligands, which were the first neuroaxon ligands we discovered many, many years ago, and that are... Um, as central to many functions of synapses are deeply involved in uh, neuropsychiatric disorders, especially autism, and are also central regulators of postsynaptic responses. So what surprised us and uh, many others in the field, I think, is that the presynaptic signaling molecules, receptor, whatever you want to call it, like neuroaxons that is in the membrane can bind to so many different postsynaptic yeah. effectors mm -hmm. and often bind via the same site on the presynaptic, but nevertheless, there is no similarity in terms of the structural mechanisms. So we and others have looked at the structures, the atomic structures of these interactions, and they're totally different. So um, it's not like, for example, when integrins bind that they have this RGD motif that's commonly shared and with many different effectors. No, it's different. You have different motifs for different ligands, even if they bind to the same site. It's uh, quite remarkable. And that explains why there is this diversity of um, functions of effects of synapses because um, evolutionarily um, there is an evolution of interactions that makes use very economically of the same signals for different purposes, which obviously amplifies the number of signals, the number of, you know, um, information processing that you can achieve and in a given synapse with a limited number of genes and of proteins. Now, you one way is you establish a you know roles for these proteins in either specification of synapses or function of synapses is by knocking out the genes, and then studying what happens with brain development or in the adult with synaptic plasticity and so on. And I noticed in you know, your re nice review articles you publish where you kind of show proteins presynaptic and postsynaptic. And then, and then you look at which genes have been associated, variants of those genes associated with, uh, for example, psychiatric disorders, mental disorders. And what what I see in your diagram is that lot, they're mostly postsynaptic. <laughs> The, the genes, in other words, and maybe this gets to your your point earlier that there's kind of uniformity of the presynaptic apparatus and its 
it's so critical to have that uniformity, whereas postsynaptic gilly, since there's so much diversity, you may, you may, uh, you know, what it could be gain or loss of function, alter the function of these postsynaptic proteins involved in the interactions, and you know, it, it it doesn't lead to devastating effects on the nervous system in terms of development or something, but it leads to clinically important, you know, behavioral problems. Is that? Yeah, yeah that is entirely correct. Yeah, I couldn't have said it better. <laughs> the synaptic diversity of uh, sort of effectors, ligands, signals, um, as opposed to the less diverse presynaptic inputs, um, I, I do think reflects the finding that the postsynaptic side tends to be more diverse intrinsically, both in terms of the cell biology and in terms of the signaling. Um, I cannot overemphasize that in terms of understanding the fundamental mechanisms that guide how the brain is put together very generally. Um, our knowledge of these fundamental mechanisms is extremely limited at this point. It is so limited that people often don't even understand how limited. For example, we have no idea at this point how a dendritic spine is formed. Why do some neurons have spines and some aspiny neurons don't have spines? What is it? How is that? Okay, we have speculations, systems, computations on no end literally thousands of such studies that calculate the computational value of spines, but we have no test of whether you actually need spines, let alone how they are made. And, you know, it's yeah, it's a complete mystery, okay? Just as an example, I don't think we understand the postsynaptic density, the postsynaptic specialization of a synapse at all. We have a catalog of protein scaffolds, and we know from beautiful work from Mengji Chang's lab in China and others that these postsynaptic proteins form some kind of face-separated domain. But which ones are actually in there, and why are they in there, and what do they do is totally unknown it's you know it's uh um it is it is there's a wealth of information in many ways there's a list of components um there are all kinds of knockout studies but there is no synthesis of the information that enables us at this point to actually mechanistically understand how a postsynaptic Garbergic or glutamatergic synapse is really done. You know how it's, what's the actual architecture? What's the, you know? And so with this huge um, gaps in our knowledge, with this huge uh, lacuna in our understanding, um, we have to be humble and yeah. basically start from you know, very fundamental questions before we can actually um, understand what's going on. And I think people in the neuroscience field don't keep in mind sometimes at least how rudimentary this understanding is. So, for example, people often debate about LTP, but we can't understand LTP until we understand, until we understand the postsynaptic um, specializations. And we certainly don't understand any form of LTP at this point, apart from the fact that we know it involves the, in the case of NMDA receptor-dependent LTP, and insertion of ample receptors, which 
is beautifully established in classical work dating back 30 years now. But um, beyond that, really, um, that still remains uh, open. So I am trying to, what I'm yeah. trying to express here is that, um, that sometimes we get ahead of ourselves in neuroscience for sure, because um, uh, the level of insight into what, how a synapse is built at this point is still at a very, very initial state. And we should remember that. And yeah. there's a lot of fundamental questions that need to be addressed. Yeah. I agree. Uh, earlier in our conversation, you, you talked about the importance of cholesterol. And so these postsynaptic densities, there's something called lipid rafts. You're well aware of this, that the regions of the membrane that have a lot of cholesterol, and it seems to be regions where signaling proteins seem to accumulate, at least in some instances. And, um, you know, we in my lab, we did this work. One of my earliest findings that turned out to be pretty important was that the amyloid beta peptide uh, interacts with membranes, lipid rafts, and it increases the vulnerability of neurons to excitotoxicity. And we think that, you know, in epilepsy, it's obvious, you know, <laughs> overexcitability, but there's a lot of evidence that there's like this insidious excitatory imbalance that's occurring in Alzheimer's disease. Yeah. But, but it, we found this amyloid somewhat, for some reason, it likes these lipid rafts. Do you have any thoughts on the lipid raft story? Um, I think the lipid raft discovery was very important because it enabled a handle on addressing a fundamental cell biology question that has been around for a long time now, which is the question of heterogeneity in the lipid composition yeah. of membranes in general, and particularly the plasma membrane. And the rafts represent a biochemical readout of a membrane domain in plasma membranes that has a specific lipid composition that makes it resistant, relatively speaking, to the detergents. Yeah. Um, it's an operational definition, not really um, a localization definition, because it's very difficult to actually localize rafts in, in a bioimaging. It's, um, so um, it's primarily a biochemical operational definition. Yeah. And of course, I think that that's another big issue in cell biology, the whole issue of how lipids in the membranes are regulated, how their composition varies, how their um, composition changes. Um, we have actually last year published a paper where we demonstrated somewhat surprisingly, I think, that gamma secretase, which is intimately involved in Alzheimer's disease pathogenesis, um, is uh, also has a key function in regulating cholesterol levels in a neuron. Um, I have no idea whether that relates to Alzheimer's disease or not. I have no idea what the mechanism is. It was a surprising finding, but it was important in the sense that via this regulation of cholesterol, it indirectly also affects neurotransmitter release which makes sense because, as you just mentioned, the cholesterol content of the membrane has a clear effect on membrane dynamics, which then in turn obviously must have a role in membrane fusion. But that's just hand-waving. The real mechanisms of that connection are still a bit um, enigmatic. Yeah, so I think those are uh, key questions. Um, as regards the amyloid beta peptide, um, I'm a bit on the fence there, I have to say, because I personally have no doubt that high concentrations of amyloid beta peptide are toxic. 
but I am not sure we know what physiological concentrations in a brain actually do. Yeah. And um, I am not sure what the mechanism by which amyloid beta peptides that are central, I'm sure, to Alzheimer's disease, but I'm not sure what that we know the mechanism yeah. of that centrality. So I'm not convinced that it's this toxicity that is actually the mechanism of that centrality. Yeah. I just feel that um, there's a, uh, <clears throat> you know, one of those things in biology is that when a lot of people work on the same thing, uh, it <laughs> tends to become very difficult to yeah. figure out what's actually <laughs> going on. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. yeah, the we um this was again early on when I was before I went to NIH, I was at University of Kentucky just getting started out as a assistant professor. And we collaborated with a company, it was called Athena Neurosciences. And anyway, so there's there's three enzymatic activities that cleave the amyloid precursor protein, gamma secretase, uh, beta secretase, which together cleave out the amyloid beta peptide from the precursor. But there's also another cleavage uh, by an enzyme activity called alpha secretase, and that occurs essentially in the middle of the amyloid beta peptide, and it releases secreted form of the APP. And we did some work with recombinant secreted APP alpha and found that it had really good effects on neurons. It, promote their survival. We did. We had a nice nature paper where he did electrophysiology and showed that it will activate these uh, high conductance potassium channels and hyperpolarize the membrane. So, you know, these mutations that cause early onset of Alzheimer's disease, like presenilin mutations or APP mutations, um, you know, maybe they're compromising the, since you presume there's less secrete APP alpha, they're, they're somehow compromising the normal function of that secreted form by reducing the amount. So I just thought so I'd throw that out there. Um, let's, let's finish up. You, you did some work on, you met work on APOE. You're talking about APOE early on and as, as you know, and others, I've had Ron Peterson and others talk about and this and talk about genetics of Alzheimer's. But the thing that was intriguing to us about that three there's three different isoforms: E two, E three, and E four. If you have one copy of E four, or even worse, if you have two copies of E four, you're at a higher risk for getting Alzheimer's. Although it doesn't mean you're going to get Alzheimer's if you have E2 or E3, your lower risk. But the difference between the three is in cysteine residues. That's it. So I think it's in those positions, uh, E2 has two cysteines, E3 has one, E4 has none in those particular residues. And when we saw that, we were doing a lot of work on oxidative stress. And when we saw that, we said, well, cysteine residues, that's something to do with oxidative stress or maybe antioxidant functions like glutathione, right? It's some kind of major antioxidant. And we actually found, and we published this, that E2 had more antioxidant activity than E3 and E4. So we were you know, nobody knows for sure, but you've done some work on this. You want to be finish up here and and kind of talk about what you've found and what you're thinking about with the APOEs. Yeah, for me, working on APOE is not only uh, intriguing because of its central role in Alzheimer's disease, which is really. Uh, cannot be overemphasized. It's the most important risk factor genetically by far. Yeah. But also because it sort of brings me back 
to the origins of my scientific career when I worked on ApoE receptors as a postdoc with Brown and Goldstein. My interest in ApoE is, um, however, not as ambitious as uh, as um, the, that of others in the field. Um, I think there has been enormous work done on APOE now that is just spectacular in many ways. Um, uh, lots and lots in particular in mouse models that looks at causing various APOE humanized mice with various disease models and looking at all kinds of pathology um, and other components. Um, what I'm fascinated by, what I'm interested in, is more sort of uh, basic cell biology questions, yeah. which is what does this APOE actually do in brain? Is it a lipid transport adapter as it is in blood, or does it have another function? Um, APOE is induced dramatically upon activation of macrophages and microglia, which are obviously related. And why is that? Why do they make that stuff? Is that for lipid transport? Is it truly involved in lipid transport? Brain? We don't actually know that. There is no, there's more than 10 different APOE receptors, many of which in brain are actually signaling molecules that are, for example, relin receptors, you know, very, very important for a number of yeah. uh, processes. And now, most recently, now even implicated in Alzheimer's disease, quite convincingly. Um, do these APOE receptors all serve as lipid transport receptors for an APOE that lipid transports, or does APOE do something else? <laughs> Our own work suggests that APOE may be a signaling molecule that has been, <coughs> excuse me, that's been suggested previously by others. So it's not our discovery; it's just something we confirmed. It may be involved in signaling at synapses. Again, we have strong evidence for that, but that could be indirect. It might not be direct. After all, cholesterol does play a role at synapses, so it could be via cholesterol. So there's, these are the kinds of questions that I would like to ask without any claim that this might is necessarily related to Alzheimer's disease. I'm just interested in the fact that in the brain locally, as a response to injury, you get this massive production of APOE. And why is that? What is the injury response here? What does this serve? What is the function of this? And what do different APOE receptors actually do in this injury response to their risk? So that is um, where I would like to, uh, with the expertise that we have in analyzing synapses, that's what we do for life, for a living. Um, <laughs> that is what I would like to really address in that field, which where I think is is uh, is something where we might be able to contribute just a little bit and um, complement what um, others, bigger and really more competent labs, are doing in terms of trying to address Alzheimer's disease. Yeah. The last last question that has to do with with something I I wasn't really aware of instead of until I started looking through your and that is artificial synapses. What what is an artificial synapse? That depends completely on terminology semantics. Okay. We call artificial synapses synapses that you specifically induce by a molecular manipulation and that wouldn't be there if you didn't do that manipulation okay okay and um, the idea being that if we can make artificial synapses at some point it may be possible to engineer circuits that might actually be beneficial for people huh well, that's interesting yeah and so are, as far as your your kind of working systems for that is it is it go from cell culture on up to? Yep. Uh, huh, yeah. Good. 
That, that's exciting. I imagine some of these young graduate students would be attracted to that. It is an idea that others have had as well. I mean, it's, you know, like many good ideas, lots of people have them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And let's see if we can make it work. Yeah. Okay, Tom. I know you know I'm retired. Retired a few years ago, so uh, my time is less important than yours. So I'm gonna oh, let it's... you go. And I appreciate you taking the time. I know you got a big lab and a lot going on. So thanks a lot. Well, I don't have a big lab, but there is stuff going on. Thankfully. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Bye, Tom. Bye. <laughs>